I'll start us off by uh, thanking you on behalf of the panelists for staying with us through this, what's been a wonderful symposium so far. Uh, again, my name is Erica Wilson and I'm a prof professor here at UNC. Um, so I wanna lay the groundwork for this panel by noting that in um, what is now an infamous decision in Washington v. Davis, the Supreme Court considered the constitutionality of an employer's use of facially neutral employment tests that resulted in a racially disparate impact uh, for African-American candidates. The court emphasizedly concluded that the constitution um, does not prohibit facially neutral policies that have a racially disparate impact, absent proof of a discriminatory purpose or intent. Um, this intent standard imposed by Davis has had a profound effect on the modern development of the equal protection doctrine. As our panelists will discuss, the rejection of the disparate impact and embrace of this intent standard hollowed the relief available to uh, people of color, particularly African Americans under the 14th Amendment. I think it's important to point out that this is the case because of the way that modern racial discrimination works, right? Racial discrimination in the modern context is often effectuated through the use of race neutral methods and institutional arrangements that interact with patterns of historical racial subordination to create um, racially exclusionary results. Uh, and so the court's uh, thwarting of disparate impact in Davis and embrace of the intent standard uh, insulates this kind of modern form of discrimination from constitutional scrutiny. Um, also, as the panelists will talk about, uh, we saw the equal protection doctrine stretched with the Supreme Court's decision in Bakke, which interpreted the 14th Amendment equal protection clause in ways that opened the door for, door for reverse claims of discrimination um, and claims that the equal protection clause uh, was also intended to and uh, needed needs to protect the majority or whites. Um, so these two cases have had a profound impact on the way that the Equal Protection Doctrine has been deployed in modern times um, to address racial discrimination and have also had a profound effect on the ability or lack thereof of Equal Protection Doctrine to uh, substantively make a difference in terms of undoing uh, centuries of racial subordination, uh, particularly for African Americans. Um, so the good news is that you don't have to listen to me talk about this for an hour and 15 minutes, but we have an esteemed panelist uh, who will discuss the trajectory of this doctrine. Um, as Alan uh, mentioned, uh, we have Professor Asamudia James, uh, Professor Jerry Spahn, and Professor Lee Spotty. Um, so I'm going to get us started uh, in this conversation by asking the panelists uh, to comment generally on the question of when and how the modern Supreme Court went wrong in its equal protection um, jurisprudence and what you think should be done about it. Each of our panelists will generally answer this question, uh, then we'll have a facilitated conversation between uh, the panelists and myself, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Asamudia James to get us started with this, uh, what should be a really riveting discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Wilson. And I wanna start by thanking the organizers of this conference and panel for including me in the conversation today. Uh, it's a delight to be in the company of such distinguished co-panelists, but it's also a delight to be in the company of future colleagues. So this is particularly special for me. I'm gonna open my remarks by uh, about uh, equal protection and talking about it as a cornerstone of modern equality jurisprudence in the United States. Equal Protection Clause states that no state shall deny to any persons within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws ratified by the states during Reconstruction in 1868. 14th Amendment encompassed specific intent to abolish Black codes. The Southern states attempts to negate the 13th Amendment prohibition on slavery by targeting Blacks for unequal treatment in labor, land ownership, and criminal penalties. Just four years later, a court fully aware of the doctrine's commitment to African Americans interpreted 14th Amendment's pervading purposes as securing freedom of the slave race, the security and firm establishment of that freedom, and the protection of the newly made freeman and citizen from the oppressions of those who had formerly exercised unlimited dominion over him. Justice Miller, writing for the majority, further noted that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all specifically intended to address the grievances of race. Now I could detail all the ways in which contemporary eco-protection jurisprudence has not done all it was intended to do. There are tactical problems. 
Equal protection has been critiqued as balkanizing groups by appearing to award benefits or protection to particular groups at the expense of others. Identity itself has been critiqued as essentializing individuals, reducing them to only their race or ethnicity. And doctrinally, the identity canon is closed, offering solicitude, however watered down, to race and ethnicity and parentage, to a lesser extent, religion and gender, but to neither class nor, um, but not to class um, or sexual orientation, excuse me. But I want to focus, however, on two problems in particular. The first problem is how equal protection renders minoritized identities as impoverished and problematic. Judicial pronouncements regarding the salience of identity in general and black racial identity in particular are juristic, rejecting race as a lens through which legal actors might assess obstacles to achieving substantive society, societal equality. Key desegregation cases, for example, like Dowell and Freeman v. Pitts, illustrated impatience with any long-term commitments to race conscious integration remedies. In higher education, the court has consistently refused to acknowledge societal discrimination as a compelling interest, embracing instead the easier to de-race diversity. And in voting rights cases, the court relies on aspirations of colorblindness to ignore reapportionment schemes that dilute black voting strength, and to suggest in cases like Shelby that absent burning crosses and hoods, pre-clearance requirements encompass unnecessary and troublesome acknowledgement of race and racism that are simply no longer justified. Further, cases like Brown illustrate the court's fixation with impoverished Black identity, manifest in doll tests purporting to suggest that young Black children hated themselves when the doll test suggested only that Black children understood whites' preferred social hierarchy. Similarly, a line of affirmative action cases from Baki to Gruder to parents involved repeatedly present Black people as guiltily taking benefits they don't merit and whites as innocent victims in all of it. By staying committed to this binary, white affirmation and black deficit, we miss not only the curative and protective benefits of minoritized identity in general and black racial identity in particular, but we also fail to recognize the political utility of identity, blind to the ways in which recognition of race helps us understand and respond to democratic misrecognition among citizens, alerts us to defects in our democracy, and operates as a crucible of sorts that produce necessary social movements as we continue our push for equality. The second uh, part, the problem with equal protection I'd like to address is inversion, a problem about which I can spin two different narratives. One inversion narrative is the one with which we're all already familiar. In the absence of an anti-subordination framing for equal protection, courts get equal, equal protection claims exactly backwards. Both benign and invidious racial classifications are subject to the same forms of judicial scrutiny, such that facially neutral laws with disparate impact and minority groups are preserved so long as discriminatory intent cannot be found, while race conscious government policies with specific intent to ameliorate racial inequality is prohibited, thus eroding protections against racial discrimination in labor and employment, education, criminal justice, and many other spheres of American life. The second inversion narrative is a little less familiar, although no less dangerous. And that's the way in which equal protection is increasingly used by the courts to grant legal solicitude to groups who have not been saddled with disabilities or subject to a history of purposeful unequal treatment or been relegated to a position of political powerlessness. Rather, the court is instead granting legal solicitude to people in the majority, when we're thinking about race, often whites, who have been made powerful on account of their race or as powerful as other factors like class or racial or sexual orientation would allow them. We saw this, for example, in Parents Involved, where the court not only struck down a race conscious school assignment plan as a violation of equal protection, but suggested that in doing so, it was protecting the white parents who had brought the suit and who had been harmed by their racial classification as white, a classification these, students, these parents understood as the reason that they could not enroll in the school of their choice. More recently, we saw it in Masterpiece Cake Shop, which doesn't deal specifically with race, but thinks about this, uh, it features this inversion problem in the context of sexual orientation. There, the court found that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had failed to review claims regarding the refusal of white straight Protestant males to serve LGBTQ couples with the proper neutrality, finding that Colorado had exhibited hostility to religion. In Masterpiece, those seeking accommodations on religious grounds had, as Professor Melissa Murray has put it, reframed themselves as dissenters from majoritarian norms. And the court was happy to oblige that reframing, thus weaponizing anti-discrimination law against those whom it was originally meant to protect. 
And if we brought in our lens even more, even those decisions that seem like equality victories for minoritized groups ultimately work to benefit those in the majority. The diversity rationale that came out of Bounty divorced race conscious admissions from notions of racial justice, such that predominantly white institutions of higher education can now make superficial attempts at improved racial optics, do little about substantive equity on campus, and still get sued by primarily white interest groups for it, as was the case in the latest Harvard, Harvard Affirmative Action litigation. Similarly, in Obergefell, all of the cases understood as a win for LGBTQ rights. The court fails to declare sexual orientation a suspect class, and in so enthusiastically inviting same-sex couples to behave more like, I put that in, in scare quotes, behave more like opposite sex couples, the court only reinscribes a social and status hierarchy that places heterosexuals and white Christian heterosexuals in particular at the very top. We think about Obergefell as a win, but in fact, I believe it lays the groundwork for more of these inverted equality claims later when white males feel displaced. In a time of increasing material and psychic precarity, both phenomena, jurispathic approaches to minoritized identity and the inversion of equal protection to protect the majority is a particular challenge. Materially, under an aggressive and increasingly unregulated form of capitalism, insecurity in infiltrates more and more American households. Incomes have stagnated or fallen even as GDP, GDP and work productivity have increased. Voluntarily and household incomes is on the rise. Political and corporate leaders shift responsibility for the risks of work, illness, or old age to employees. And instead of risk sharing, choice is used as a disguise behind which people are really left to self-insure themselves and their families. Psychically, whiteness is increasingly being decentered in social spaces. Noted journalist Thomas Edsel, for example, has named status as a key driver of increasingly intractable societal conflicts and situated increasing identity politics among whites as a resentment that never sleeps in response to the fading hegemonic power among the previously powerful. Ultimately, status threat and accompanying rising anxiety among whites, regardless of financial well being, drove results in the 2016 presidential election and will continue to shape American politics for some time to come. Moreover, the roots of this problem are embedded in doctrine. Brown, for example, was not framed by the court really as a problem of white supremacy. It was framed instead as a problem of black inferiority, allowing the court and society to move toward integration without disrupting a social order in which whites are inevitably placed at the top. As equality movements look to more aggressively disrupt our racial hierarchies, those at the top will increasingly feel insecure. Now, the problems of materiality, of economic insecurity, should turn our attention to a more robust set of class politics that might be able to move us forward. Economic precarity is touching more and more people in the majority, revealing for more and more people the benefits of a living wage, universal health care, affordable higher education for us all. But that does not, however, eliminate the problems of status disorientation and the very real sets sense, regardless of economic insecurity among whites, that they are losing something as we work to bring people of color and black people in particular more fully into the franchise. And in that environment, not only will we continue to see equal protection challenges that present whites as innocent victims in need of protection, but we will also lose grounds in efforts at racial equality on account of an equal protection jurisprudence that will be, unfortunately, sympathetic to those claims. Now, I don't have much in the way of solutions and anti-subordination framing for equal protection would address both of the problems I've addressed here today, particularly the latter problem of inversion, but equality scholars have tilled that barren field for generations without success. And for it to take hold, we need a radically different core composition, which is not soon forthcoming. I do believe, however, that my co-panelist, Professor Jerry Spahn, will give us some insight into how to squeeze water from a rock by sneaking in equality law and legal work through the jurisprudential cracks. And so with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take, um, answer more questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor James. That was wonderful. Um, I'll now turn it over to Professor Spahn, who will pick up on some of the threads uh, where Professor James left off. Uh, so th thank you very much, Professor Wilson. And I'd also like to thank my co-panelists. And I especially want to thank the UNC Center for Civil Rights, all of you for giving me a chance to just sort of vent for a while about race and the Supreme Court. 
In fact, I'd also like to thank Mitch McConnell. His recent manipulations of the Senate confirmation process have unapologetically added the Supreme Court as a political institution. The justices are selected by a process that makes their personal ideologies dispositive, and the Supreme Court's political ideology has historically favored the interests of whites over the interests of non-whites. That's particularly troublesome now in the renewed quest for equality that's followed the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others. The way we proceed can help determine whether we move forward toward the goal of racial justice or backward to a time when our commitment to white superiority was as explicit as it is oppressive. Okay, so there's a lot of racial inequality out there, but our current culture has largely learned to mask overt racial hostility with indirect forms of structural discrimination. And the prevalence of implicit bias shows that much current racial discrimination is unconscious. As a result, neutralizing racially disparate impact offers the most trustworthy way to end ongoing racial discrimination. But the Supreme Court, in its infamous Washington versus Davis decision, rejected a discriminatory effects test for unconstitutional discrimination and held that the Constitution actually protects disparate impact discrimination as long as the intent to privilege whites is not overly conspicuous. The court's decision of personnel administrator versus Feeney then adopted such a narrow definition of intentional discrimination that even knowing indifference to racially disparate harm does not satisfy it. The current law is simply not responsive to contemporary forms of racial inequality. Moreover, as Dan Farber has pointed out, the Supreme Court's racial jurisprudence is itself racially discriminatory. The court ignores disparate impact that harms non-whites in discrimination cases like Washington versus Davis, but invalidates disparate impact that harms whites in affirmative action cases like Adirond and Gratz and parents involved. The Supreme Court is one-sidedly protecting whites and reliance on the Washington versus Davis intentional discrimination test has now become the standard way of shielding white privilege from constitutional challenge. The new 6-3 Supreme Court conservative majority seems unlikely to reconsider the rejection of disparate impact as a form of unconstitutional discrimination, but there's a way around the court's recalcitrance. All other things being equal, in a non-discriminatory culture, we would expect the racial distribution of societal resources to mirror the racial makeup of the pertinent population. It would therefore make sense to utilize affirmative action programs to replicate the proportional distribution of resources that our history of discrimination has precluded us from achieving naturally. However, in regions of the University of California versus Bakke, Justice Powell barred race conscious remedies for what he termed societal discrimination. And in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court reaffirmed its off-stated view that the pursuit of racial balance through the use of quotas is patently unconstitutional. Those views are consistent with a long history of Supreme Court decisions that sacrificed non-white minority interests in order to benefit the white majority. Cases like Prigg versus Pennsylvania, Dred Scott, Plessy, Korematsu, and even Brown itself. But within the confines of the court's existing equal protection rules, we could still seek to remedy the racially disparate impact of our present resource allocation schemes by relying on chance rather than so-called merit in the allocation of resources. Consider university admissions. Rather than utilize the grade point averages and standardized test scores that we typically view as measures of merit, university admissions could instead be determined by lottery. Statistically, the racial profile of the admitted class would then reflect the racial profile of the applicant pool. Assuming no significant barriers to entry, each racial group would get a share of university seats that roughly approximated its proportion of the population. Lotteries would mimic the resource distribution that would exist in a non-discriminatory culture, and randomization would serve as a statistical safeguard against structural discrimination and implicit bias. The universities could ensure that they were admitting only qualified students by setting minimum standards for participation in the lottery, as long as those standards did not simply replicate the racial disparities of our current admissions criteria. Nevertheless, there would be a cost to lottery admissions. As Justice Thomas recognized in his Grutter opinion, in the absence of demanding admissions standards, prestigious universities would lose selectivity as a tool to establish and perpetuate their elite status. But if we had to choose between a system that allowed fancy schools to retain their elite status and a system that ended the racially disparate impact embedded in our educational hierarchy, 
choosing to remedy pervasive racial discrimination seems plainly preferable. Notwithstanding the goal of reducing disparate impact and increasing racial balance, lotteries would almost certainly be constitutionally valid. They are facially neutral with no impermissible because of invidious intent to harm whites under Washington versus Davis. Rather, their permissible intent is to improve educational quality under Feeney in spite of any disparate impact that that might have on whites. Even Justice Thomas seems to agree, stating in Grutter that open admissions or abolishing the SAT are valid race neutral ways to promote diversity and nothing is more race neutral than a random lottery. Lottery admissions are a viable alternative to GPAs and test scores. Some European universities already use lotteries. Uh, some US high schools and charter schools have expressly begun using lotteries as a means of reducing the disparate impact of racially correlated measures of merit. Analogous lottery-based selection strategies could also be used to combat racially disparate allocations of other societal benefits, such as jobs, construction contracts, FCC broadcast licenses, and COVID vaccines, all of which have continued to privilege whites disproportionately, despite our existing legal prohibitions on racial discrimination. There's admittedly some controversy surrounding lottery-based resource allocation. Opponents claim that lotteries would improperly discount the importance of merit, but their claim is belied by the deviations from so-called merit that we now happily tolerate. For example, we embrace our current athletic, geographic, legacy and donor preferences for university admissions. And certainly enhanced racial justice is as important as those factors in justifying any departure from so-called merit that lotteries might be thought to entail. But rather than departing from the concept of merit, lotteries actually help redefine the concept because diversity of perspective is itself an important component of merit. Do we really want white males with high test scores to be the only ones in the room when we discuss cases like Brown versus Board of Education or Roe versus Wade, diversity matters. It matters a lot. Merit-based objections to lotteries also reveal that we incorporate factors correlated with whiteness into our baseline definition of what constitutes race neutrality. That's why we're so enamored of racially correlated test scores despite the racial disparities that they produce. Our culture has internalized as one of its unexamined baseline assumptions the belief that resources are distributed fairly and equitably when whites possess a disproportionately large share of them. The advantage that whites possess over non-whites is simply per perceived to be part of the natural order. But that baseline assumption is of course, just another form of white supremacy, reflecting the tacit belief that non-whites are simply not as good as whites. The history of the nation suggests that we will only be able to achieve racial equality if we force ourselves to do so. We can break out of our racially skewed conception of neutrality if we pre-commit to a strategy that will override our structural discrimination and implicit biases. And lottery-based resource allocation offers a self-enforcing mechanical way to commit ourselves to a, a, a degree of uh, racial justice that we will not be able to obtain if left to our own devices or to the devices of the Supreme Court. Ironically, mere random chance can do a better job of forcing us to value racial justice than the unsuccessful measures we have tried thus far. But I fear that we will continue to resist this strategy because I fear that we will continue to favor the familiar benefits of white privilege over the loftier ideal of racial equality. Thank you, I am done now. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Spahn. That's uh, very provocative and I look forward to discussing it more uh, in our question and answer session. Um, so we'll close it out uh, last but certainly not least uh, with Professor Boddy um, who will give us her take as well. So um, first of all, I wanna add my, my thanks as well as uh, my congratulations to uh, the UNC Civil Rights Center and all the um, terrific people who have um, organized this conference. I'm uh, delighted and honored to to be here, and I and I welcome the conversation um, uh, at the end of this panel. Um, so what I wanted to do was to um, spend my eight to ten minutes um, on Justice Powell's opinion in um, Baki, uh, 
which entrenches white innocence and resentment as a constitutional concern in equal protection and is responsible for many of the doctrinal turns that you have heard Professor James and Professor Spann mention already. And I um, here I want to give a special shout out to my, to my friend and mentor, uh, Professor Ted Shaw, who I know is going to discuss the, the Baki opinion after this panel. Um, and Professor Shaw, um, shall we say, learned me up on Baki at a very, uh, at a very early age when I was a baby lawyer. So, um, so, so I want to acknowledge him as well. Um, so you all may remember that Baki was a case about affirmative action in admissions at UC Davis Medical School. Um, Justice Powell joined with four justices to strike down the use of quotas in UC Davis's admissions program under Title VI. But he also critically writes a constitutional opinion that poisons the well of equal protection the ramifications of what you've already heard a bit about. Uh, in this opinion, which he writes um, only for himself, argues that all racial classifications, even those that are designed to serve racially inclusive goals, are presumptively unconstitutional. And it's important to focus on what that means, right? It means that he's placing affirmative action race conscious affirmative action on the same constitutional plane as Jim Crow laws that were designed to segregate and subordinate uh, black people and other non-white people. What's important here is that he rationalizes his argument by invoking white innocence and the specter of white resentment toward any uses of race that seek to remedy generations of racial subordination. And I want to read for you the language that he uses, which is from footnote 34 in Baki, because I think it's important to hear uh, Powell's own words as he comes to this conclusion. He says, all state imposed classifications that rearrange burdens and benefits on the basis of race are likely to be viewed with deep resentment by the individual's burdened. The denial to innocent persons of equal rights and opportunities may outrage those so deprived and therefore may be perceived as invidious. And he goes on to say that these individuals are likely to find little comfort in the notion that the deprivation they are asked to endure is merely the price of membership in the dominant majority, and that its imposition is inspired by the supposedly benign purpose of aiding others. And he concludes by saying one should not lightly dismiss the inherent unfairness, the unfair, uh, excuse me, the inherent unfairness of and the perception of mistreatment that accompanies a system of allocating benefits and privileges on the basis of skin color and origin. Um, now, there is a lot that one can say about this, but let's start by noting that it says nothing about historical context. It erases historical context from his proposed constitutional calculus. He says nothing about enslavement and segregation and ongoing racial discrimination. The deeply rooted intergenerational harms that created the need for affirmative action in the first place. And when we read this language of innocence, we know that he is referring to white people. And we have to ask ourselves, if white people are innocent, then what is he saying about black and brown people and Asian people and Native Americans? And you can hear from some of what uh, Professors uh, Spann and Professor James have already said about the ways in which black and brown people are minoritized and devalued Right, the contributions are overlooked. The potential is overlooked and degraded. Right? And this, we see these ideas surface in Justice Powell's opinion in footnote 34. And what he seems to be saying is that the presence of non-white people in institutions of higher education as a result of affirmative action is not legitimate. 
and that white people are undeserving of those opportunities. And at the same time, the presumption of innocence that is conferred on white people who are somehow denied access to institutions of higher education means that they should have a, almost a, you know, a right to attend certain institutions of higher education and affirmative action is denying them that right. And what we have seen in so many affirmative action cases are white, uh, are white plaintiffs who challenge the consideration of race and admissions, even though they would not have been admitted to the university without that affirmative action program in the first place. Uh, justice Goodwin Liu, before he was a justice, wrote about this in the Baki case. We've seen that in other cases, like the University of Georgia case, like a uh, case out of Rutgers, actually, where a white plaintiff alleged that he had been denied admission, unjustly denied admission to the university, even though he would have been denied, even without any consideration of race. And so race here occupies uh, an enormous amount of um, the terrain of white resentment and white frustration at any indication that people of color are somehow benefiting from race conscious policies. Even though he writes for himself, Powell's opinion has far reaching consequences. It helps to create a constitutional framework that prioritizes malice and guilt as the benchmarks for judging equal protection claims. And these benchmarks are embraced later by the court in Feeney and Croson and Adirond and uh, parents involved in some of the other many cases that you've heard already today. These benchmarks also set the procedural and, substan and substantive rules of equal protection. That is, it applies strict scrutiny to any claim that involves considerations of race um, by rejecting the use of race to remedy pervasive racial inequality, what Powell referred to as societal discrimination that is also illegitimate under Powell's uh, framing of the issue, um, and also limiting remedial uses of race to identify discrimination, specific instances of discrimination that have to be proven by evidence of bad racial intent. And the reason for all of this, Powell suggests in his Bakke opinion, is that we have to protect white innocence that part of our constitutional duty under the 14th Amendment, the very provision that was ratified to make real the promises of freedom and democracy and opportunity for black people emerging from slavery is to guard against white resentment. That is likely to result from government policies that rely on racial classifications to improve opportunities for people of color at the perceived expense of white people. So Powell crudely and cruelly, I'll add, twists and perverts the meaning and spirit of equal protection. Uh, there's been some conversation already about Washington versus Davis and Arlington Heights and a mention of Feeney. Um, I'll just stop here by noting that this perversion is fully realized in Feeney, in which the court explicitly embraces the malice test which begins to shift equal protection away from what uh, Ian Haney Lopez has referred to as the contextual intent standard that it had embraced in Davis and Arlington Heights. So embracing this rationale, the Supreme Court has concluded that individualized considerations of race by state actors are presumptively disfavored and under most circumstances completely prohibited even for purposes of remedying pervasive racial inequality. And one last point. So I've talked about what I'll refer to now as the equivalence principle, which is that strict scrutiny applies to beneficial considerations of race that are intended to benefit people of color who have been long been excluded from the fabric of American society, um, as well as to intentionally discriminatory uses of race. The origin of this principle, as I've described, is fear is, a, is grounded in a fear of white resentment and outrage, that beneficial considerations of race are harmful to white people. And it reflects a perverse race conscious colorblindness and equal protection, right? That is equal protection is guided by principles that limit considerations of race in order to protect white people. <laughs>
and I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. All right. Um, well, thank you all so much. Uh, a lot for us to uh, chew on uh, in terms of what you've, uh, you've all uh, told us. Um, so one of the common themes that seems to go throughout all of your remarks is this idea of uh, white supremacy and that our equal protection doctrine operates against the context of white supremacy and that some of the rules that come out of the doctrine are related to uh, protecting, uh, as Professor Body uh, alluded to, notions of white uh, innocent uh, and potentially the backlash against uh, white resentment. Um, so I want to ask a start uh, our conversation by asking a question for uh, actually Professor Body. Um, so you note that uh, the in the Baki uh, decision that Powell um, was against. Uh, using race to as a basis for eliminating societal discrimination. Uh, and I think many of us can maybe agree, or most of us can agree that societal, societal discrimination probably does deserve some forms of race conscious redress. Um, but a uh, question is what, what should the limits um, of any permissible government action be uh, if we were to allow um, societal redress of, of, through race conscious uh, admissions. Uh, since frankly, um, uh, the role of the government in perpetuating racial subordination runs so deep uh, and is so deeply ensconced. Is there a way really uh, to use the doctrine to appropriately address race, uh, address uh, societal discrimination in a way that would have manageable limits? Sure. Thank, thank you for the question. And um, just a just a quick note. So when um, when we talk about the pervasiveness of racial inequality, because race is everywhere and it, it affects everything, I'm reminded of um, I think it was was a Justice Brennan's um, opinion in in McCluskey where he said we have a fear of too much justice. Right. We have a fear of too much justice. Right. That's that's the, that's the first problem. Um, but I think we had doctrinal tools for addressing this, right? It was Washington versus Davis that uh, that uh, decimated, um, for the most part, disparate impact doctrine, at least as a sole basis for finding intent, um, the intent standard as it was um, perverted in later years um, under the, the Burger Court. Uh, uh, I mean, and, and the foreseeability doctrine that came, uh, that was, sorry, that was um, decimated by, uh, by the Feeney decision. Um, disparate impact was a workable uh, doctrine. Uh, the foreseeability test that had been adopted uh, to help identify uh, disparate impact was also quite workable, especially um, in the, the context of school desegregation cases. There were many courts that were working with those standards to try to, uh, to work through um, the effects of, of rampant uh, discrimination. So I think that um, we had tools, but uh, the court has has rejected them. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I think that uh, leads nicely into a question for Professor Spann who uh, very provocatively suggests a, a different path that we could take uh, in terms of his idea about lotteries for college admissions um, as a way to better distribute access to elite university. Uh, universities. Um, but I guess a motivation question there for you is what would induce elite universities to take such a step um, in the absence of massive and highly resistant coercion? Um, um, so I have an answer. I hope you're just not going to laugh at me because um, <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Um, the When you look around it, it, as um, Professor um, Body just emphasized when you look around at how pervasive discrimination is, and as Professor James has emphasized, when you decide that all the victims seem to be the white people whenever we try to remedy that, it's pretty clear that something is out of whack. And I have to give it to universities so far, at least sort of standard Northeastern universities. They seem to have identified this as an issue that they want to address, causing me to think, yeah, they like, um, racial diversity, and I'm giving them a strategy for racial diversity. They have promulgated these affirmative action programs that have been challenged by sort of white so-called victims and 
often invalidated by courts. Well, here's a way to do it that won't be invalidated by courts. So why don't you just do it because it's the right thing? If that's unlikely to work, um, I have a fallback argument. Because we're going to withhold your funds under Title VI if you don't, because it constitutes racial discrimination if you just acquiesce in the existing disparate impact. Now, I understand I don't have, I don't have the votes to do that on the Supreme Court, but that's a problem with the Supreme Court. That's not a problem with the theory. Okay. Um... So I think that feeds nicely into actually Professor James' point about uh, precarity. Uh, and Professor James, you've written in previous scholarships um, that perceptions of diminished social status, status relative to minoritized or lowest status group often prompts attempts by the privilege to reinstate their superordinate status. Um, so in some ways playing off of Professor Spann's idea about uh, the lotteries, um, do you think or hope that this increasing social precarity uh, of the present time might actually induce whites to adopt proposals to do the right thing, as Professor Spann said, that would be fair or more equitable for all groups, um, including non-whites? So I, I think that um, the, the impulse of people to get on top and try to stay on top, um, and, and that's not always sort of a, I need to hoard, even though I do think people give into an impulse to hoard, sometimes it's sort of things, in the word you use is precarity, things are unstable and I need to find a way to create some sort of um, stability and climbing over people to get as high up as I can. Um, and that, that's gonna create some floor be below which I won't fall. And I think those are, those are impulses, we could call them right or wrong, natural or constructed, but they are impulses. And I think a big problem with our, our legal system our democratic system is the way in which politicians have capitalized on that impulse, right? Um, and, and really encourage people to continue moving in that direction or affirm their sense that it's the right thing to do, right? And when I think about um, the, you know, the, the, the integration cases in the early 1990s, the court was essentially telling my people, yes, please do run and we will protect your running. That is the right thing to do. And so I am encouraged by the work of Ian Haney Lopez and others who, looks into how messaging can by politicians will push people in one direction or the other. The, right, when he was thinking about why Trump was even able to make some gains under um, among people of color, the idea that a lot of people can be uncomfortable with a race narrative and might push a, pull away from, let's say, a Democratic Party because um, these messages about racial equality are unsettling for them, right? And the alternative is giving them a message that they like. Um, or, or they feel like, well, we don't have to deal with that because we don't like the use of race. Um, and he was suggesting that if you can flip your use of race to tell people it's being used to divide us and you can help people understand that, right? That, that we're, people are using race so that none of us have healthcare. People are using race so that none of us are getting access to good school. People are using race so that none of us have any job security, right? If we could push back and band together, we could sort of create some stability for ourselves, right? If you can effectively deploy that messaging, you might be able to make some progressive gains. Right? And so I don't want to say it's not possible. And I do think that if politicians and policymakers are thoughtful about the precarity that people are experiencing and think thoughtfully about how they use their narratives around race in, in, in the midst of that, right, you can get people to behave differently. That being said, I don't want to be naive about the real sense of disorientation and instability that people who have enjoyed being at the top and don't even realize that they're at the top right, have when things start to look different. Um, the sense that they are losing something if other people get more. And those themes, those ideas are, are aspects that can be very deeply embedded parts of American culture. And so I do think even if you can get sort of coalitions that band together to try to create stability for everyone and sort of understand how race is being used in that narrative and how it could be used productively, I still think you have to confront people who believe that the natural order of things is for some people to be at the top, that that is justified, that that's legitimate, that other people are on the margins or at the bottom because they deserve to be there. Um, and that a change is not just a reordering of the hierarchy, but a loss of culture, right? A lot, uh, 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 a flipping of history. 
um, and a distortion of what the proper state of affairs is. And, and, and that has to be confronted no matter what. And, and I don't think if people talk uh, exclusively about sort of class politics, I don't think you get, um, I don't think class politics gets you all the way there. I think you, you do have to confront the norms of white supremacy that are in fact deeply embedded in our society. Um, so that's also a great segue. If we think about the law as structuring societal norms and the way that we behave, right? Um, to Professor James's point about disrupting notions of precarity and um, trying to coalition build around the idea that this is hurting all of us in a more equitable distribution uh, would help all of us. Um, back to Professor Spann, uh, one um, potential counter argument uh, to your proposal regarding lotteries is that, right, um, it would eliminate the cachet of elite universities. Unfortunately, we're not there uh, yet where the, the names don't matter and that cachet is still important. Uh, and arguably, uh, right, it might water down their significance at the exact same time universities are becoming more diverse and more people of color are getting access to them. How do you respond to that counter argument, Professor Spann? Okay, so I think that's a good and an important point. And don't get me wrong, the last thing on earth I wanna do is upset voluntary efforts by universities to increase their diversity. But as I suggested earlier, I think universities ought to be in favor of lottery random based ambitions because it'll do a better job of doing what they're trying to do now. Um, with respect to the threat to the elite status of Harvard and Yale, um, I'm, I have two, two answers. First of all, I don't think they're gonna lose their elite status because for a lot of reasons, they're Harvard and they're Yale. They've been around for a long time. This is tradition surrounding them. Uh, they have enormous endowments. They have fancy faculty that publish fancy things in fancy places and the newspapers call them up when they need quotes. So I think the threat to elite status is marginal. But my real answer, my fallback answer actually reflected in one of the questions that I think was, was posed in the, in the Q&A is um, what would be wrong with just homogenizing universities? Why do we have to have this hierarchy? The thing that matters is that we give people university educations when we think it will help them. It, 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 if all the schools are the same stature, that strikes me as progress, not a problem. Okay. Um I should also add uh, for our audience members, if you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them uh, in, in our, the latter 10, 15 minutes of our discussion. So I wanna shift gears here now. Uh, and per this is a question for everyone, but perhaps we can start with Professor Body because I know you've written about this. Um, as I alluded to in my opening remarks, right? We know that the way discrimination manifests itself in modern times is complex, nuanced, and not easily captured uh, by the current equal protection doctrine, particularly with its rigid intent requirements. Um, how might the doctrine evolve to capture the nature, nature of discrimination today, um, particularly what we call implicit bias? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, I think there are, I think there are ways to ca well, I I think there's a good argument that there are ways to capture implicit bias through existing intent doctrine. Um, I and I you know and if that were to happen, I think that's a good thing. I'm not sure how much work implicit bias or a, a recognition of implicit bias in the doctrine. Um, would do to dismantle uh, these very deeply rooted uh, structural inequalities that, that we face today. Um, and maybe that's just me being pessimistic in this moment. <laughs> um, but I, um, I'm, I'm not sure that implicit bias will do it. I think that we need um, a system of laws and policies that are, uh, that are connected um, and very, um, adaptive ways to address uh, issues of, of racial inequality, that we need some flexibility, um, not only in the way that our doctrine is interpreted, but the way in which our doctrines are deployed uh, to be, you know, to sort of um, 
to adapt as the systems adapt. And I don't, we have not been able to, um, to accomplish that uh, in part because I think we've, we've relied too much on sort of Eurocentric um, uh, legal paradigms rather than looking to, um, I'm not even, I mean, I guess uh, federal law is a possibility, but also even state and local laws um, that, could, that could adapt more quickly to, um, to, uh, inequal to local and state inequality. Um, I know, Professor Spann, you've also uh, talked about the role uh, that disparate impact uh, analysis might play. Any thoughts on the way that disparate impact uh, analysis might be deployed to deal with uh, modern forms of discrimination, uh, particularly implicit bias? Yeah, so one of the reasons I'm in favor of a disparate impact understanding of the equality concept and equal protection clause uh, is precisely because there's so much structural discrimination and so much implicit bias floating around out there. Washington versus Davis just is not addressed to that problem. We're not gonna pick it up. Because it's unconscious, because of a lot of our discrimination is unconscious, the only way we're gonna be able to pick it up is through sort of statistical measures like for Justice Thomas, it would be open admissions and getting rid of the SAT. For me, it would be using lotteries. But that's the whole point. Just disparate impact, I think, is the thing that matters. If you're not willing to go along with me on that, at least it seems to me you ought to go as far as Professor Body wants to and either abandon or reformulate Feeney or go as far as Professor James wants to and stop treating whites as if they were the victims of the racial problem. Um, so... There is the 63, 6 of 3 Supreme Court majority that's unlikely to do what I'm suggesting or unlikely even to put their, their head in this space. But I think it's important for the rest of us to understand that all of the grievances that have been articulated so far, the reason we need Washington versus Davis as opposed to disparate impact, those are all rooted in a notion of preserving white privilege. They start with the assumption that under the current state of affairs, things are equal, and if we change the current state of affairs, then whites will be harmed. And that's just the wrong way to look at it. So my answer is just for impacts what we ought to do. Okay, um, fair enough. Uh, and so I'll ask Professor James to follow up on that uh, because you actually in your comments said something that really resonated with me um, in terms of the way that equal protection doctrine has looked at uh, black or frame things through a black deficit lens, right? Uh, and you also alluded to the possibility of uh, reframing the, the doctrine in a way that uh, focuses on anti-subordination instead of anti-discrimination or anti-differentiation. So can you talk a little bit about what an anti-subordination framing of um, the equal protection uh, jurisprudence would look like? Sure, right, so an anti-subordination or maybe even a redistributive justice version of this would place an affirmative obligation on the state to um, address disparities, right, in the way resources are, are distributed and act without any sort of reference to intent, right? And so we could look at any number of Amer areas in American society, housing, education, um, healthcare, and think, are there disparities here? And without suit, without trying to sort of um, uh, ground it in intent doctrine, we have an obligation to address these disparities. And, and we might even frame it as to the extent that these disparities reflect historical patterns of discrimination. The issue is I can think of very few places or very few areas in which it's not rooted in some sort of uh, history. And so that question is less, um, is less of a problem with me, although you do get to the, the too much justice problem. If you're afraid of too much justice, yes, there's gonna be a lot of places in which we might have an affirmative obligation to act. Um, and so I think that's one piece of it. I think the other piece of it is how the court has thought about identity, sort of a, a distancing from it, because we, we think about identity as linked to minoritized identities, and so it must be bad, right? You're only talking about this because those people are, are clinging onto this thing that's that's not useful. Not only will white people resent it as if they don't have identity, which is not the case, um, but why would you want to be associated with that? And so there's a distancing of it, which I think creates all sorts of problems. Um, it affirms what I see is misrecognition. Melissa Harris Perry has talked a lot about this misrecognition in society. When people get confining, demeaning, contemptible, 
images of groups, it distorts those groups, right? It distorts their experiences and it distorts their experience in uh, a democracy. It undercuts their no notions of citizenship. And there's a link between that distortion and your attempts to even redistribute, right? You cannot effectively redistribute cultural value or material resources if you don't properly recognize citizens. Right? It's, it's a reason why the, the surest way to tank policy is to racialize it, right? Uh, a housing subsidies would be great for everyone unless we think housing subsidies go to black people and then we don't like it, even if it means elderly white people are not gonna get the subsidies that they need. And so that, that misrecognition undermines our attempts to, to move forward under any sort of politics, whether it's sort of a class politics or, or race, ethnicity or identity-based politics. And so I think an anti-subordination framing would help us get at a lot of that, um, but also would respond to the, 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 the tendency of the court to think about identity as this terrible thing, as opposed to a factor that we have to respond to, think about how it orders our society, and also think about how we might use patterns related to identity to understand, to diagnose what problems are in our democracy so we could address them and move forward. That's a nice segue um, to ask you all about uh, affirmative action. Uh, Professor James mentions uh, an uh, affirmative obligations to act. And so one of the few arguably uh, anti-subordination like um, frameworks we have is affirmative action. And so I have a general question here and then a more specific question here. So the First Circuit recently issued an opinion upholding the constitutionality of Harvard's affirmative action plan, um, specifically as it relates to the claim that the uh, Harvard's, uh, Harvard's admission plan discriminated against Asian Americans. Um, and so that case or potentially uh, the case involving UNC even may very well make its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, so I'm interested generally in the panel's thoughts on how the court might turn the Supreme Court could go um, if one of these cases makes it up to the Supreme Court in terms of the interpretation of uh, the equal protection doctrine there. Um, the more specific question I have is that given what we know is a more specific, a more conservative makeup of the court, I think it's fair to say that we might expect them to continue as they've been doing to privilege things like uh, right to free exercise of religion and religious identity. Professor James mentioned the um, ways in which racialized identity has been cast negatively, but uh, arguably the court hasn't taken the same tack when it comes to religious identity. Um, does it strike you as inconsistent, the idea that a more conservative court might interpret the constitution in ways that privileges religious identity, but then turn around and curtail the ability of universities to consider racial identity, where particularly where applicants have self-identified as belonging to a group, which the university might find value in having more people from that group on campus. Um, so maybe put more succinctly, how can we reconcile the disconnect between the court's tra treatment of racial identity identity versus religious identity. I, I can I can jump in here. Um, so so first of all, I do I do think there is an inconsistency. And if you look at the free exercise cases that have come out of the court that do heavily emphasize and even um, establishment clause cases that have come out of the court that heavily emphasize the importance of um, religious identity. Um, and I agree with you that that is in stark contrast to the way that the court has um, has has treated race. Um, I don't think there's any way to shame this court, quite honestly. Uh, so they they may be uh, happily willing to live with that incongruity. Um, and, you know, I I will say that I think um, uh, one thing that strikes me, um, and it may or may not be persuasive to um, five justices on the Supreme Court, but I think it does have, it might have an intuitive appeal in, in public discourse, which is the idea that um, an important aspect of one's identity, whether it be race or religion or, you know, or some other um, facet of one's personhood um, should not be sort of equally valued in the constitutional calculus. I do, I think that there is something sort of intuitive about that, right? You'll consider in the context of diversity, you'll consider, um, uh, religion, you'll consider uh, uh, sex or gender, sex and gender, you'll consider, um, you know, religious principles, you'll consider where they grew up, where a person grew up and whether they play, 
uh, the piano, but you cannot consider race. And that just some, I mean, especially now, given the moment that we're in um, with Black Lives Matter, and I, you know, and I, and parenthetically, I do think that there is a way in which um, Black Lives Matter may be reshaping um, uh, disc public discourse, certainly, and maybe even um, uh, legal discourse in other realms, if, if not the Constitution. Um, so I just think there's, there's something counterintuitive. If you lay out all the different ways in which people are identified, the way that they express themselves, and then to take race off the table, um, uh, I think would seem odd to many people, especially in this moment. I don't, um, well, I'll stop there and let, and let everyone else talk. I have, I have two thoughts in response to that question that I wanna explore. The first is the idea, I think, of, when we're talking about religious identity, I think the court is really thinking about white Christian religious identity. Um, and in that way, it's, un it's understood as sort of the baseline, as good as the, the normal, the natural order of things, such that when um, you know, white Christian males in particular come forward and say, I can't exercise my right to this thing that we all know consciously or, or, or subconsciously is the natural state of things, the court feels justified in being like, well, we have to protect what's natural and right and good. And we contrast that to the court's exhaustion about race in general, right? And Shelby Roberts remarks that, look, no one's burning, I mean, he didn't say this, but it was essentially no one's burning crosses. And so we don't really need this anymore, right? And it's a dissent that gives you a sense of the second generation voter disenfranchisement that's happening and the way in which it's still creating disparities. But Roberts is like, we just don't live in that world. They're done with it, um, but are sort of attuned to the ways in which the natural order of the world, the natural order of the United States as expressed through white Christian identity is being disrupted and so there's an impulse to protect it but it is um it, it's, it doesn't make sense right it's not co it's not coherent in that way unless you take a step back and think about how these things are culturally understood by the court and by society in general in terms of the um affirmative action litigation i am not optimistic about it and i do think that we have to be careful or or we have to watch the way in which the court is going to use asian penalty in the admissions process as a cover for dismantling affirmative action. Um, and, and I think that question around how Asians are treated in the pool is a complicated one. I think it's something that we have to pay attention to, right? To the extent that we do think that Asians are being penalized for that more whites can be admitted. Like we have to think about that. And we've been through several rounds of this. And, you know, uh, uh, in some Asian communities, opposition to um, these more race conscious um, initiatives. We've seen that at the K, uh, at the K to 12 level with the elite schools in New York City. We saw that in pushing back uh, to attempts to reinstate race conscious affirmative action on the on West Coast uh, uh, California schools. And so I don't want to sort of put that aside. I think those are real concerns and there are serious dynamics that we have to think about that question, again, sort of that pushback at a black white binary in terms of how we understand race to force us to think hard about coalition building and forces us to think with more granularity about different the different experiences of the large group we call Asian in the United States, right? Which have actually very different histories and experiences um, and, and looks different in some communities than it does in others. At the same time, Right. This is, for me, classic triangulation of Asians, right? They are valorized as better minorities than Blacks and Hispanics, and so they deserve overrepresentation in these places, but they are also understood as unassimilable, right? So you don't actually read them politically, and so in the elite K-12 to uh, high schools in New York, they weren't consulted in any of the planning to eliminate the standardized testing and instead uh, do sort of top 20% admissions across the city, right? Because they're not actually American as Asians are not, they're not, they don't figure for us politically. And so we just don't consult with them with the plan that's going to decimate Asian enrollment in those schools, but we, we um, defend the existing plan by saying, well, look how hard these Asians worked. If Blacks and Latinos would just work as hard, they too could get access to the Stuyvesants of the world. Um, and that dynamic, I think the court is going to use it in a way that justifies undercutting, dismantling, continuing to sort of chip away at affirmative action or the diversity rationale, maybe just getting rid of it altogether. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, that doesn't serve anyone but white people, doesn't even serve Asians who the court will suggest it's protecting 
by taking that action. Can I can I just respond very briefly? I I, I believe I um, I agree with uh, with what uh, what Professor James has said. Um, I think one thing to think about um, with respect to the current composition of the court, uh, it seems that uh, Chief the Chief Justice is no longer quote unquote in control of the court. Um, I would have said. Um, before uh, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed um, and he had, was still retaining a slim majority um, that what sort of Roberts would have done in the context of affirmative, affirmative action is what he has always done, which is to sort of um, adopt a new standard for evaluating uh, the constitutional question um, in the case before him with the, with the long range goal of um, eventually overturning it under the new standard. And so I don't know, I mean, now he seems I, I think it's right that, that Roberts is an institutionalist and does care about per, uh, public perception of the court. Um, but I, he's, it doesn't seem like he's the one who's driving the, um, the ship, the truck, whatever it might be. <laughs> um, I think he's, he's out of it. So it'll be interesting and, and possibly um, heart-wrenching to see, to see what happens um, in the case. So Wilson, I think both of your questions are good and important. With respect to your general question about affirmative action, I share the views of my co-panelists that the Supreme Court, the current Supreme Court is unlikely to look favorably upon affirmative action cases, including the Harvard case if it gets there. Uh, the reason for that is I've written elsewhere is I think the Supreme Court understands that one of its social functions is to protect white privilege. So if it looks like white privilege is going to be eroded, it will step in to do its, so, its societal job. Having said that, I have two minor reservations. So that's, I, I want to be clear about that. That's my ultimate conclusion. I think Supreme Court is not going to be at all friendly to affirmative action going forward. If the Harvard case is the one that gets there, there is something about Harvard. I mean, this is Justice Powell in Bakke, right? There's, you know, the Harvard exception to constitutional law. And if this is the Harvard case, maybe they'll uphold it because it's Harvard. And if you think about it for a second, if they're gonna be a really conservative court, occasionally they have to let the bad guys, that's us, the people that favor affirmative action. Occasionally they're gonna to have to let the bad guys win. And a Harvard case might be the time that you do it. So, you know, in, in Gruder, they uphold the Michigan Law School plan, but they invalidate the university plan in Gratz. So every now and then they'll uphold one. Um, the other thing I wanna say, uh, and I'm not sure if I actually agree with what I'm about to say, but I think it's important enough to put on the table. I think the Supreme Court thinks its job is to protect white privilege. The strongest argument against the constitutionality of the Harvard Affirmative Action Plan is that it constitutes invidious discrimination against Asian Americans. I don't agree with that, but I understand the argument. And so what I'm thinking is, yeah, but those are Asians. Those are not white people. Those are the people that we put in concentration camps in, the, in Korematsu in World War II. Those are the people that we now blame for the Kung flu virus. Uh, we might, this court might be willing to sacrifice the interests of Asians, meaning it might actually uphold a Harvard Affirmative Action Plan. Uh, I'm not predicting that, it just strikes me something we might want to pay attention to. With respect to your, your, your question about sort of affirmative action and religion, again, like my co-panelists, I think that two instincts are completely irreconcilable. The court just seems to have a stronger preference for protecting religious liberty than it does for protecting racial liberty. Um, but, so this strikes me as interesting. I mean, I, I'm gonna sound like a law professor, but it does sort of pose the question of how the Supreme Court would react to a claim that someone's religion required affirmative action in order to avoid complicity with structural racism. Now, we already know the court has honored the claim of someone's religious uh, beliefs requiring an exemption from the contraceptive mandate in order to avoid complicity with birth control. And it also looks like the court has honored the claim that someone's religion requires an exemption from general anti-discrimination laws in order to avoid making a wedding cake that might show complicity with same-sex marriage. So why don't we write, we can do it right now. 
We will just all adhere to this new religion that is so opposed to racial injustice that we think we have to adopt effective affirmative action plans in order to avoid complicity with structural discrimination. Uh, if we all sign on, I think the court under these religion precedents has to uphold our affirmative action. All right, I'm done. I think that goes back to Professor James's point about the uh, about sort of the free exercise and and, and establishment clause jurisprudence privileging uh, Christian the Christian religion um, and. Uh, you, and you have to show that they're actually that the religion is actually a mainstream religion. So well, I didn't. I, I wasn't claiming this was going to be a winning argument. <laughs> it's an argument we'd be able to condemn the Supreme Court for, for rejecting. I'm with uh, you. Let me start, let me say one other thing. If it turns out that the court is unwilling to buy the claim that my anti-discrimination religion is not a real religious claim, but it's just sort of some moral claim, but it accepts the religious claim and not the moral claim which it, the court seems perfectly prepared to do, that does strike me as an establishment of religion. That's exactly what the Establishment Clause is designed to prevent. And the court seems to just be sort of running roughshod over that part of the Establishment Clause. Okay, so now I'm really done. Okay. So we have uh, about five minutes left. Uh, and so I'm go going to take um, questions from the Q&A. Uh, I will try and um, synthesize some of them. So a few people have asked uh, Professor Spann about your lottery uh, suggestion, uh, uh, your lottery proposal um, and the potential for it upsetting uh, the education uh, hierarchy. I'll add a more nuanced question to it, which is this. You referenced the idea that lotteries have been used, for example, with public charter schools. But one of the things that we've seen with those lotteries is that um, social capital dictates who's even in the lottery, uh, right? That the way that, that the lotteries in some ways uh, reified the existing social orders and social privileges uh, by using techniques that uh, afford folks with more social capital the ability to know about the lottery and participate in a lottery. So the question for you is, um, is it possible or do you have any concern that your proposed lottery system could in fact uh, reify some of the same uh, kinds of racial disparities that you uh, are, are trying to address due to the dissonance between um, social capital and race? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really concerned. About it. First of all, just so everybody knows where I stand, if it turns out that the lottery just equalizes university status, I can live with that. So I don't view that as a problem. I do view, however, as a serious problem, the danger that when universities try to specify who is eligible for the lottery, they will apply criteria that just replicates sort of the current hierarchy and admissions. And because I'm just a thoroughgoing legal realist. I don't think there's any linguistic way that we can prevent that from happening. We can't come up with a standard that will prevent that from happening. But I'm hoping that if schools actually want diversity, and at least elite schools seem to really want diversity, they will want to do this. They will want to make it work. They won't want to submarine it. If I'm wrong about that, then this won't work. Okay. Um so I'll leave you all with one more question uh, for the entire panel. Uh, in the brief two minutes we have left, closing words for everyone. And the question is, uh, we're obviously in the middle of a challenging and potentially transforming period for our country. Uh, the recent uh, insurrection uh, by white supremacists, the fallout from COVID-19, to name a few things, um, are, may fundamentally change the way our, society, our country looks. Is there a path forward through which we may be able to re revitalize the equal protection doctrine to institutionalize more racially equitable practices? Big question, uh, I know for the last uh, two minutes we have left. I'm actually, I'm actually, I like that question and I'm, and I'm optimistic that the, the social changes that we're seeing now that have been wrought by the pandemic and I think um, off the top of my head, right? We've got stimulus payments to people who um, are unemployed. We have um, uh, the college board limiting the use of SATs. We've got people embracing healthcare for all where they you know, were previously reluctant to do so. Um, and I, th I think that's um, so often the, I mean, so often is maybe an overstatement, um, but the court doesn't like to get too far ahead of where society is. 
And so um, one possible outcome of this, this very tragic time is that if the court sees how sort of the, you know, the public people around the country um, are embracing a, um, a new social order, a fair and more just social order, um, then you know, maybe it would be less inclined to strike down laws that are intended to, to achieve the same result, <laughs> provided they're done through, so through uh, race neutral means. Um, so I think that's, I, I, so I'm optimistic about that. And I think also uh, we can't overstate the, uh, the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, we've, you know, people who are putting up Black Lives Matter on their, you know, in front of their houses and carrying signs about Black Lives Matter. Um, and uh, so when we think about sort of the, the court's uh, reluctance to, uh, to, I mean, <laughs> to even acknowledge that race matters, um, it's there's there's a possibility that um, when I when I have my more optimistic hat on, uh, that this discourse could could maybe push some of the justices in in that direction. But but ask me in five minutes, I may say something totally. Different. Um, sorry. So we're at uh, time now, uh, and I want to respect the panel of the symposium and let us get uh, on board. Um, so thank you all so much for your wonderful contributions, and that's a positive note for us to end on.